I am now unmuted. Welcome to the first Little Tokyo Virtual Earth Day Celebration! Coming to you live from all over the city of Los Angeles. Actually, uh, uh, that building back there, that's the JACCC. And uh, that's where we were supposed to be doing this, but then uh, stuff happened. Anyways, I'm Styro, your PVC PET MC. And over the next hour or so, we got people to meet, gardening secrets to learn, ideas to share, and a whole planet to honor. Our theme for today is community and motainai. Now, if you're with us today, I'm guessing you already know about community and how important that is. But you might not know about motainai. Well, Basically, it's the Japanese concept of don't waste, okay? It's what your grandma would say when you didn't finish your dinner or you left the water running too long. Motai nai, yo! Ow! Grandma, that's plastic abuse. Uh, anyways, you'll hear more about motai nai later on. Say, did you know Earth Day was created exactly 50 years ago? That's right half a century. You know, uh, back then, uh, the state of our planet was looking kind of grim, you know. Uh, there were very few laws or regulations protecting the environment. Uh, people were driving around cars with big V8 engines burning leaded gasoline. Uh, uh, offshore oil spills were creating one disaster after another. Factories were dumping chem chemicals anywhere they wanted. And by the late 60s, things were getting out of hand. Well, around that time, astronauts on one of the early Apollo missions took some very special photos. Photos that showed something no humans had ever seen before. Our planet. A beautiful, delicate blue and white oasis floating in the vastness of space. Earth. Well, that photo became an iconic symbol of the environmental movement, part of a gradual shifting in human consciousness as people began to realize, hey, this is our home. We better take care of it. Wake up and smell the chemicals. So, in 1970, the first Earth Day was declared. That same year, the Environmental Protection Agency was created. Uh, so was OSHA, protecting workers from unsafe conditions. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Air Act of 1970, the Clean Water Act of 1972, and on and on and on and on and... You thought all we got from the 70s was disco. Uh, 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 uh. Nope. Well, today, Earth Day is observed in over 190 countries by some one billion people. And as time passes, the challenges facing our planet are constantly shifting and mutating from global warming to pandemics. I mean, if we don't watch out, we're going to go backwards. No, not the 60s again. Which is why you need to get someone in the White House with a functioning brain. Anyways, so everyone's got to do their part, citizens and leaders. The extended Little Tokyo community is doing its part with this virtual Earth Day. Our celebration is hosted by da -da -da -da, Sustainable Little Tokyo and Fandango Obon. What is Fandango Obon? And can it be cured by a good orthopedic surgeon? Well, here to tell you all about it are Nobuko Miyamoto, Artistic Director of Great Leap and one of the creators of Fandango Obon, and Sochi Flores, producer of this wonderful annual event. Uh, Nabucco, Sochi! Welcome, everybody. 
do uh, our first virtual Earth Day from Pandangobon, a little uh, sustainable little of Tokyo. Um, and thanks, uh, Styro, for your great presentation. I learned a lot more about uh, uh, Earth Day, and you know, you are really good at recycling. So here we go. Um, Pandango Bone is coming into its eighth season, bringing uh, pe people into a circle from the Mexican, Japanese, African American, and Muslim communities. Uh, we, we share our participatory um, art, music, and dance traditions, the ways that people have been gathering through time to keep their communities connected. And it's been a powerful way to deepen understanding and build relationships between people of different cultures. At the same time, we also focus on environmental knowledge because this is the way our people have thrived and sustained through time when every day was Earth Day. So um, like everybody else, we're trying to figure out how to carry on our work. And the challenge for the arts community is we're about bringing people together into the same space. So this is a big experiment for us. From, from ancient times, humans have been gathering in circles to give thanks, ask for rain, good crop safety, healing, and we need that now, just the same. But we're gathering around our computers. And this has been an unprecedented time, and it's pretty radical. I've never seen anything like it in my lifetime to literally stop the world and see that we're all connected. And this has brought out some heroic and human uh, actions by, by people, but it's also brought out ignorance, racism, and divisions. And this is why we have to continue doing what we're doing and try to spread it. Now, you might think that um, dancing in a circle is sort of a, you know, quaint idea. But actually, there's science behind it, that when we breathe and move together, that we are tuning our energies in together. And um, as Jahana from uh, Le Ballet d'Embaya will tell you that when people drum and dance together, the hearts actually synchronize. So this is an old new way. It's another recycling, uh, kind of recycling. So let's just start uh, right now with a little breath, uh, just to tune us in, okay? So breathe in. Exhale, just relax. Feel your feet on the ground. Relax your body, straighten your back. Inhale, exhale. And follow me, okay? A little circle. In the circle we dance, exhale. No beginning, no ending, exhale. In the circle we dance. I am you, you are the other me. Sochi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I am you, you are the other me. Um, that is a, a Nahuatl term uh, we use, called, uh, it goes in la quech, which means I am you, you are the other me. We are all connected. And like Nobuko said, um, dancing in a circle is part of um, lots of cultures and their traditions for hundreds of, it goes back hundreds of years. So um, be, you see a fandango behind me, uh, people dancing on a tarima and musicians playing music in a circle around the tarima. Um, this is fandango. Fandango is, is an uh, act of being together intentionally, of connecting, of creating community. And that's what we do with um, Obon as well. Um, typically we'd be doing our, planning our workshops for Fandango Obon at this time. 
And because of the way things are now, uh, we're going to try to do some workshops online and, and we're going to invite the community in to uh, participate in these workshops somehow. Um, for now, I think we're going to do um, some dance workshops, some songwriting. Um, we do them all over the city. We do six to eight a year. So we're going to continue that and just do our workshops online and gather people around their computers. And um, yeah, I do a, a Saturday workshop, a dance, a zapateado is what, what you see behind me, um, people dancing zapateado. And I do that every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. And I'm going to continue that um, until until people don't need it anymore, until we can be together in person. And um, I think that this is a beginning to a new way of being together. And it also, in, I think, um, can be a way to look at how people from far can join us, um, how um, people who can't get in, in their cars and drive over, or who can't take public transportation, or who have mobility issues, can join us. So I think that um, with these challenges, uh, it's pushing us to be more inclusive and more um, thoughtful in the way that we that we um, produce our events. So I look forward to seeing you all around your computers um, until we can be together again. So it's no we'll go again. <clears throat> One of the things I love about these workshops is that we actually get to visit communities and uh, see and remember that we have shared histories and shared neighborhoods too. Um, so this gives me a lot of hope. Uh, and I hope that by doing this virtual uh, workshops that we could take you around different parts of the city and maybe across the country to share uh, what people are doing that is making a di big difference in how people can live today. So at, at the uh, end of the season, which is in the fall, uh, Bandango Bong's culminating activity is going to be this big festival, which we do every year. This year it's a little bit earlier, it's in September 27th. And by hook or by crook, I think we should get together by that time, even if we have to use gloves and masks uh, to dance in the plaza of the JACCC and really tune in together and celebrate um, our connectingness. So until that time, uh, let's take this time to gather around our computers. Thank you, Nobuko and Sochi. Well, that explains Fandango Obon, which happens right here in the plaza, right here behind me at the JECCC. But what about sustainable Little Tokyo? I'm glad you asked. It is now my plastic fantastic pleasure to introduce the energetic, ebullient, and effervescent Scott Oshima, Program Director of Sustainable Little Tokyo at the Japanese American Cultural and Community Center. Scott, please tell our friends about SLT at JACCC. Hi everyone, I'm Scott Oshima and I don't have a fancy background, <laughs> but I work at the Japanese American Cultural and Community Center. We are one of the partners and the host and home for the Pandango Obon Festival every year. You saw the plaza is where we always come together and dance. Um, I am uh, the program director for Sustainable Little Tokyo. Um, so JACCC is short for the Japanese American Cultural and Community Center, uh, is a hub for Japanese and Jap Japanese American arts and culture and community. Um, and we, we are actually one of the largest cultural and community centers of its kind in the nation. Um, and then Sustainable Little Tokyo is actually a coalition between JACCC and the Little Tokyo Community Council and Little Tokyo Service Center um, that is a community-wide initiative of people and organizations who love Little Tokyo, um, who came together to imagine a future for the neighborhood and then work together to um, make it real. Um, and so we have a long-term campaign controlling uh, land and development in the neighborhood, but then we have really incredible arts and cultural programs to bring our community together with events and really amazing festivals like Fandango Obon, like Hiro's Bokashi Club, which we'll be sharing about. So we're so happy that you're here. 
Um, this event is made free. Um, so I am also tech in the background. I'll be hiding in the back. So please, um, you know, add any questions to the Q&A. And um, you can also chat with us in the chat window. And then please feel free to donate. Um, we'll share information in the chat box on ways that you can donate towards this project and our organization. So thank you so much. I'm going to hand it back over to <laughs> Styro. <laughs> Next, we're going to hear from Amy Hongio. Ah, that's that lady right there. Amy is an awesome little Tokyo activist who's the champion of garbage, the cheerleader of composting, and the queen of bokashi which you'll hear about more later. Uh, uh, your Highness, uh, Your Highness Honjio, onegaishimasu. I, I, I'm I here, have a word, I'm please. here, I'm here. Thanks, Tyro, thanks very much. Um, and thanks to all of you for taking time and out of your altered schedules and your worrisome days. Um, for myself, uh, even in these times, I find moments of perspective and realize that really every day is Earth Day and that we are all connected and are responsible to each other and for the sustainability of our planet. And even though you may think that food waste collection and recycling is a small cog, it is really a critical link in the recycling of food and it's our opportunity to thank the earth for all the food that it's given us. And there are some people that in little Tokyo that I'm very grateful for because they understand the urgency of food waste recycling and they've committed time, energy, and I think actually enjoy themselves almost as much as me in the recycling efforts. And for starters, I would like to recognize, hmm, well, this wasn't the slide I was expecting, but it's a good slide. These are all good, oh, here we go. And I wanted to recognize uh, the Japanese American Cultural and Community Center, um, both as Scott mentioned, in support of Sustainable Little Tokyo activities, as well as contributing to the food waste. And you'll see on the screen right now is Raphael. Let's go back. There's Raphael, my favorite person there at JCCC, who connected a water source to our compost, which is critical. Thanks, Raphael. And I'd also like to give thanks to LA Compost, who built our compost bin and actually provides ongoing support. And here is a picture of Jonathan Galindez giving us the thumbs up on our finished compost. So before I start to thank the composters, I, I want to mention that collecting food waste is, uh, is a really a change in behavior and it's a challenge sometimes for all of us, but in trying to build a community of food waste collection has other challenges as well. And the first thing in working with small business restaurants was that space was a premium and that there was no space for a food recycling bucket. But these two businesses committed space and support from their staff in collecting of food waste in their back of house or kitchen. And I'd first like to thank longtime community supporter James Cho of Cafe Dulce. Hi, thank you, Amy, so much. Um, I'm sure you guys know, or I actually don't know if you really understand how much food waste is um, created in a, in, a, in a restaurant environment. And it's always been something that's on my mind. And when Amy came to us and said, hey, can we collect your food waste? Albeit our space is very small, we were more than happy to contribute just because I feel terrible whenever we throw away trash. So thank you so much. Thank you, James. And also uh, we have uh, a business who has been a long time sustainable little Tokyo supporter and is now heading our uh, efforts in having a little Tokyo community garden. Uh, I'd like to introduce Bobby Roshan of Demitas. Hi everyone, um, I'm Bobby, I'm with Demitas. And um, like what James said, the, the amount of waste just from coffee beans and, and spent coffee grounds that we created was just going into the waste bin. So it's great to have somewhere we can 
um, put these to better use and hopefully we'll see the compost created going into a uh, community garden soon. And then we can grow stuff out of the waste that we create, which has always been sort of our dream for the neighborhood. So thanks for um, organizing this and thanks for having us. Thanks to Bobby and to James. And um, those two um, have solved the problem of collecting food waste from back of house and front of house or the consumer waste food, um, Little Tokyo um, Towers, which is a 30 unit uh, senior apartment uh, arrangement. Um, they have really been committed for the past year to collect food from their senior lunch program, which means they have to sort through and sift out the liquid and then collect it daily for me. And um, they've been a very dedicated staff and the uh, food coordinator there's name is Mariko Miyazato and a special thanks to her as well. I think she's working with her seniors right now and, and wasn't able to join us. Um, but in addition to having restaurants and lunch programs, we have a lot of organizations who maybe don't generate as much food, but still are concerned about the kind of food waste they do generate. And I think I call these representative from the organizations as sustainable champions because they have taken it on themselves to be sustainable and are in the mode of trying to convince their organizations to do as well. And I'd like to start with the Little Tokyo Service Center. And there's actually two representatives, Wataru and Loana, but we have Wataru here today. Hi everyone, my name is Wataru. And at the Little Tokyo Service Center, we have an office of maybe around 60 staff. And we've been saving our used coffee grounds and tea bags into a little can in our office kitchen. And every week we take it to the uh, community compost bin down the street. And it's super easy to do. And our staff feels really good about knowing that we're reducing our waste and helping the community and making our gardens grow. Thanks, thanks Wataru. And um, an organization that maybe uh, people in Little Tokyo may not be as familiar with, but has also been, uh, well, they're an organization that does um, support and advocacy for affordable, accessible, fresh food in our city. And uh, this is a champion, Jasmine Zosaya from the LA Food Policy Council. Hi everyone, my name is Jasmine. Um, we've been composting for, I would say, about a year, Amy. Over. Um, maybe a little over. Um, it was actually pretty challenging to get everybody in the office. Um, right now we're a staff of eight and everybody's so busy and in and out of the office at all times, but it's really held um, our staff accountable and made us really practice what we preach in regards to uh, food waste and you know sustainable agriculture. So it's been, a, and it's been a good team building exercise as well. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, Jasmine. And our last um, organization representative and really a zero waste advocate as well, we have from the Gopher Broke National Education Center, Andy Kimura. Hi everyone, uh, Andy from Gopher Broke National Education Center. We've been doing Bokashi in our office of about 15 people for around a year and a half. Um, and we use the buckets and we take it over to the compost bins at JCCC. Um, it's been a really great way to uh, get involved in the community, but also uh, start those conversations around um, reducing waste. Um, we do it for lunches, but also involved in our veteran potlucks. So it's great for them to get involved in as well. And I think to me that one of the biggest wins is one of my coworkers, Ken. So shout out to Ken if you're watching, um, has committed to doing Bokashi at home um, as his 2020 uh, resolution. So hopefully that continues on with others. Thanks, Andy. Andy's also a big Bokashi advocate as well. Thank you. And okay, so we have restaurants, we have lunch programs, we have organizations, and we also we want to involve in our little Tokyo community, the residents. And I like to think of this as our, our model resident here. And uh, she, she religiously brings her little canvas utility cart down the street to the compost bin, but I'll let her talk about it. This is Nancy Uemura. Hi, everybody. I bring frozen garbage 
I bring my food scraps that I accumulate in my freezer to spice up Amy's compost bin. Her dream of giving back to the earth through a small but mighty project inspired me to help her because friends don't let friends dream or compost alone. Thanks, Amy. We can stand together, even if we're six feet apart, and give back to the planet. Thanks a lot, Nancy. I, I'm going to use your quote about uh, compost friends stand together. So thank you very much. And in closing, I'd like to um, share, on behalf of Sustainable Little Tokyo, um, a special certificate for each one of our composters thanking them for being a champion within their organizations and in support of Little Tokyo. So, Cafe Dulce, and one for oh, no. Mitos, Little Tokyo Towers, and Little Tokyo Service Center, LA Food Policy Council, one for Broke, and one for Nancy. And now, in closing, I would like to invite all of you to join our Little Tokyo community and give our composters a round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, time for a word from our sponsor. Hello there, friends. Do you want to deal responsibly with food waste, but don't have room for a real composting setup? Like the idea of compost, but don't want to wait for months before it's usable in the garden? Do you wish you could do something with your meat and dairy scraps like you do with your plant-based garbage? Well, now you can with Bokashi! That's right. Developed in Okinawa, Japan in the early 1980s, Bokashi is a fundamentally different method of processing food waste. Traditional composting relies on the process of decomposition, rotting, to break down food waste. But instead, Bokashi ferments it. Using Bokashi microorganisms contained in a special anaerobic containment vessel, also known as a bucket with a lid, Bokashi prepares food waste to be broken down into usable gardening material in as little as 10 days. You can use it for meat and dairy products too, and it can be done right in your own kitchen. Curious? Well, I should hope so. For more information about Bokashi, go to the link in the chat window or email Amy, the queen of Bokashi. I, I wonder if she gets residuals for doing that. Oh, oh well. Thank you. Now, it's time for our featured presenter. Master gardener, botanist, and mycologist, Florence Nishida. A longtime gardening teacher, Florence is the founder of LA Green Grounds, formed 10 years ago to improve availability and access to healthy food in under-resourced communities. Okay, LA Green Grounds is a 100% volunteer group that connects with local residents to build home gardens. Yeah! Their one day dig in event empowers and encourages participants to grow their own healthy organic food. Right on! LA Green Grounds teaching garden, located in South LA, is open to all visitors as a base for community building and a source of gardening knowledge. The garden is also an urban natural habitat, attracting birds and interesting insects. Ooh, whoa, whoa. They offer classes and volunteer days with practical exposure to various edible plants and cooking tips. Florence! Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here. I really appreciate Little Tokyo, Sustainable Little Tokyo, inviting me to participate in this, um, to talk about the things that are really dear to me. And I want to acknowledge how uh, the significance of Earth Day um, makes me really think about where we are now. It was very exciting in 1970 to be part of the first Earth Day, and we've slipped a little bit from that. And I want to remind all of us that the earth is our mother, as so many people around the world for so many, uh, for millennia have considered. And we need to take care of her because she is taking care of us. And I think that when we garden, 
we want to garden with care and the concept of Moktainai I'll touch on as we go through because um, that's an important part of the conservation of, of our resources. In these uh, very sort of trying and worrisome times, uh, I thought it would be good to talk about what you and everybody who's living this through this time can do to improve your food access, but also to alleviate that stressful concern. Uh, by gardening, I think you will find the activity itself is really health promoting because it's relaxing. And, um, and actually scientists have pointed to chemicals that an actinomycete, which is like a fungus in the soil, produces, which makes us feel less stressed. So in actuality, gardening is physically helpful to you as well. So what can we plant and grow and eat now and also for later? When I first made this talk, we were in early or late spring. The weather was cool. It was raining. Do you remember that? And now it's summer. So we're going to go to the next slide. And I want to remind all of you, I've been going on walks and seeing all of these free food, some people call it forage food, some people call it weeds. They're plants that are really good survivalist plants themselves. They have survived millennia without anyone caring for them. And many of us don't realize that these are also edible. They can be collected away from roads, of course, away from where you might have contamination, but I think if you look in your own backyard or your neighbor's yard, you will find some of these growing. If you have been too busy to weed, they're there. So on the left is the common mallow. That's the sort of uh, fan-shaped plant. It is everywhere, as is the chickweed that's growing underneath it. The chickweed has little tiny white flowers. You can collect a bunch of that and rinse it off and put it in your salads. Uh, it doesn't have a strong flavor. Mallow can be quickly sauteed. Uh, that's probably better than eating it raw and it has a slightly sweet flavor. Miner's lettuce over on the right was actually eaten by the 49ers, the miners in the Sierra Nevada where it grew abundantly, but it grows abundantly in Los Angeles. And it's also excellent raw in salads. Down at the bottom is black mustard, which was an introduction from the Mediterranean and that is the, uh, the actual plant that when the seeds are ground will produce the yellow mustard of commerce that you have in your refrigerator in a jar. That black mustard plant is the source of that. And then south thistle on the right is a very annoying weed. I hate it in our teaching garden, but it is also an edible when it's nice and young and tender. All right, the next plant I'm getting you're still using these plants that grow like weeds. We have this actually planted in our teaching garden, New Zealand spinach. It frequently volunteers in people's yards. It is a very good edible. It has a slight taste of spinach. It can be eaten raw or you can saute it. Uh, it has a slight mus uh, mucilaginous like okra quality, but it's still delicious. You can certainly use it in curries, It'd be excellent that way. I love this plant because this is one of Captain Cook's voyage of discovery in the Pacific Islands that brought this uh, to our attention. And it is because of this that he was able to keep his sailors from dying of scurvy, from the lack of vitamin C. You know, the sailors on these month long voyages didn't have uh, enough vitamin C. And scurvy is a serious illness that killed people. So they found this on, on, on the, um, East Coast of New Zealand, I believe, and or Australia. And uh, Joseph Banks brought it back to England and they could grow this on board ship because it's a salt lover. So what a great use of a plant. This is getting close to the difference between weeds and things that are planted in the yard. This is an amaranth that I planted years ago and it self plants now. It's right near my compost pile. It's a beautiful, attractive plant and very nutritious, and you can eat both the leaves. The leaves are great raw in salads. In fact, that's often put into those bought salad 
uh, mixes that you get at the supermarket. And uh, you can also saute the leaves uh, with, you know, red pepper and salt and, and uh, olive oil. It's a delicious, weedy plant. Arugula. Arugula was once planted in my yard a few years ago, and it just keeps coming back. I have a lot of it now in different parts. This is in a potted plant, a pot with, uh, with uh, onions. And I've just been cutting it and harvesting it, and I saute it, I add it to other dishes, I put it in salad, I give it away. I've got lots of volunteers. So once you have that in your yard, you will continue to have it. And if you like arugula, it's free. All right, self-planted lettuce. This is in our teaching garden. Obviously, we had a workshop and we were teaching planting seeds, and some of the lettuce seeds fell to the ground. We keep a lot of mulch on the ground to keep the moisture in place. And so these seeds had germinated and um, have now grown into quite good size uh, plants. So it's, that's red lettuce. And this is a tip for you. Keep mulch on your pathways and in your garden. And so seeds will find a receptive home there. This is now my, this is uh, starting the plants that you on purpose plant. This is Japanese purple mustard. I am so glad I discovered this a few years ago. It is one of my favorite. It is my favorite mustard. It's gorgeous. It's dark purple with lime green ribs and it grows like a weed and it throws seed so that you have it forever. And here are the volunteers that I have in front of my compost pile. I have dug this up, given this away, replanted it in other places. Um, it's very hot like, um, um, what is it? wasabi, uh, when it's raw. So if you like that, it's terrific in sandwiches to give it that, that zing. And it's a wonderful mild mustard when you saute it in, in a stir fry. I finally learned the secret to growing cilantro, which used to give me trouble. Uh, because it has a smaller rate of germination. So I took a pack of cilantro seeds and I just threw the whole thing in the ground in my bed and I got several plants growing. After that, it was a piece of cake because as it gets late spring or in the summer, I let about four of those plants go to seed and just stay there while I clean out the other uh, brown stuff. And it just throws its seed in the soil and I have it in the next spring after the winter rains. So this is something you always should do. If you have a plant that you like, let it go to seed, at least one or two plants, and they will plant themselves in many cases. Shungiko is best known to Chinese and, and uh, Japanese uh, cuisine. It is an actual chrysanthemum. It's called the edible chrysanthemum, and it has multiple uses. You can eat the edible, le you can eat the leaves, the tender stems, and the flowers are a yellow daisy, a beautiful plant to have in your garden, and it's all edible. It is wonderful in soups. It's the classic green that's used in the Japanese New Year's ozoni soup. It can, it's terrific in skiaki, or in other words, a mixed uh, stir fry with, um, with other vegetables. It has a very unusual flavor, but you'll like what it does uh, with the other flavors of the things you're cooking. It is also, you can also prepare it like spinach. You can steam it, uh, wring it tightly dry, and then add some ponzu sauce to it, and it's really delicious. I really advocate that you add whatever greens you have, be it kale or broccoli or collards or um, the mustard, dandelion, any of those. Always add it to a pasta dish because you'll get the vitamins from it. It will add that bright color to it. Uh, and then if you're a vegetarian with pasta, some kind of protein um, bean is good. I love garbanzos for that reason. And, um, and this is a very quick dish that anyone can prepare. All right, now I'm gonna go into some of these vegetables that are really worth planting because I call them grow forever vegetables. Chard, this is chard from our, in our teaching garden. I think we've had this at least two years, going on the third year. We had another one that went for about four years. They are beautiful plants. You can plant them in with your flowers, in fact, and I think people miss a beat when they separate an ornamental bed from a vegetable planting bed when you can combine those two. 
you always harvest greens like this, like chard and lettuce, by harvesting the outer leaves. You don't have to cut the entire plant because you're not a farmer sending your um, product to the market. You're growing this for your own table. And so always cut the outer, which are the older, the first leaves, and the plant continues to grow in the middle, giving you new leaves. Do this for chard, for kale, for collards, for um, the mustards, for lettuce. Uh, it works for all of them. And then you can keep this plant growing and you can eat from this for months instead of you know buying it once at the market and then eating it up. Here are the collard greens. I highly advocate that everybody eat collard greens. They're not just a Southern food. They uh, actually originate from Europe and this variety was brought to the colonies when they first started. So this was a, one of the vegetables that was brought over to the Plymouth colony. It's an heirloom from 1770. What does an heirloom plant mean? It means that the seeds, when you plant them, will give you the same plant back, which is a little different from hybrid plants. So when you buy a plant or a seedling that's a hybrid, it may have some, some qualities that improve you know, size or color or whatever they bred it for, but it will not necessarily give you the same plant that you started with. Whereas an heirloom plant, the seeds of that you can collect and keep and replant them. Collard greens are terrific. They are the most nutritious vegetable, even more than broccoli. They should be eaten. And you can eat the leaves. This green glaze, this heirloom vegetable, has very tender leaves and it has a very glossy leaf surface that I, I am convinced is why this has very few pests on it. And that's an important thing when you're growing at home. And then if you see the, fl see the flower uh, buds, I cut, I would say 25 to 30 of those last night on my collards. And I sauteed them with potato and red pepper and it was just terrific. So, and it's gonna keep giving me more of those buds. This is in our LA Green Grounds teaching garden, which is in South LA at Carmona Avenue and Bowdoin. If you go to our website, you'll, you'll get more details. And this is the daughter of one of our volunteers. She's holding the two kinds of collard greens. On the left, the, the uh, traditional Southern Georgia collards, which has a, a dull surface. And I think that tends to get more aphids. And the one on the right is the green glaze that I love. And then you see our kale tree in the back and also artichokes. So here are the collard green sprouts with oyster sauce. You could not beat this. This is as good as any Chinese broccoli. I know that a lot of people don't have uh, space in their yards for growing. So I am trying to do a lot more container growing so that I can teach that. I started this um, with small seedlings of lettuce that I had germinated. This is about maybe two weeks ago when I started planning for the talk. And now these plants, I would say, are at about almost twice as big. And I've already eaten salad from them twice. Because again, remember, you pick the outer, older leaves and you let the plant continue to grow. Bok choy. I did this in my more naive days when the bok choy seedlings looked really small and the pot looked really big. They get big. And so you really want to plant one or two plants at the most in a pot that's about 18 to 20 inches across. There's a parsley back there too. And so what I would do is cut out that middle bok choy and let the other two grow heartily. Same thing with bok choy. You're not collecting it the way a farmer does. You are picking the outer leaves and you're using that for your stir fry or steaming. <clears throat> you can also grow frilly kale in a pot. This is one of my favorite ones. I'm going to grow it again. Now I'm gonna transition over <clears throat> to seed starting and more important, seed proofing. I do keep seeds, sometimes for a long time. These seeds were from 2015. Depending on the, on the seed, the, the plant and the variety, some seeds will hold for many, many years and others for one year. And you can't tell which. So 
one thing you can do is take your old seeds, lay a moist paper towel in a tray, put the seeds well spaced on that paper towel, moisten another one, make sure this is not drippy wet, okay? And then lay that paper towel on top, label what you've put down because believe me, it is not easy to remember. And these sugar snap and the snow peas look absolutely identical. Then you put the whole box in a plastic bag and that makes kind of a miniature greenhouse. And one week later, I opened it up and here we see the peas that have germinated. So out of the four or five I planted, I had 100% germination from 2015 seeds, which is pretty good. You can see the young sprouts, even with new leaves formed on it, and the young long roots. So now I took that out to the garden a couple of days later, moistened the garden bed, so I don't, you don't put these little fragile little sprouts into a dry bed because that, that would just suck the moisture out of them. So moisten the bed. And then I use a chopstick very often in gardening. I use a chopstick to poke a hole in the soil about one inch deep, not deeper. And I dropped one of these in and I wouldn't worry too much about whether it's right side or upside down because plants are really pretty smart they know which way is up and which way is down. They uh, respond to gravity. And now they're doing quite well in my garden. When you plant peas, snap peas or sugar peas, and also beans, anything that's going to twine, that's going to climb, be sure you plant the supports at the same time that you plant the seeds. It's really easy for time to get away from you and you and, and before you know it, you have this long trailing and fragile vine and so when you try to then tie it up you're you're going to easily break those stems so plant the support it could be a teepee made of like four or poles tied together at the top or it could be a metal frame like this that my husband made this is great this is concrete reinforcement wire that's made into a cylinder and tied together that's an excellent support for tomatoes for cucumbers and for peas and beans. I think I've eaten my last kabocha. Kabocha is definitely worth planting. And this is a summer growing plant, so you should start it now. The kudi is on the left, the orange one. It's a gorgeous plant. Uh, the kabocha, many of you are familiar with. It is a highly nutritious, but more important, of course, it's a delicious squash. Nothing like the American squash. It's not watery, it's not stringy. It is more like a really good um, giant chestnut, I guess. The seeds are large. And here's a tip. When the seeds are large, it's pretty easy to grow them directly in your planting bed, in the soil or in the pot. But I, for, the, for the purpose of this talk and for teaching, I wanted to show the germination of these kabocha seeds. And to follow the theme of Muktai Nai, which I practice my, have practiced my whole life, not to waste, I do use recycled containers. So you can use a half gallon milk carton or juice carton, poke drain holes in the bottom of the carton, fill it with potting soil or pure compost or seed starting mix and moisten it and then plant your seeds. I planted, I think, two, uh, two rows in that milk carton and then I'm going to have to set carefully separate them out and to remove them from the carton is easy. Just take a pair of scissors and cut the side of the box down so then you don't have to try to dig some kind of a tool inside there. If you cut the side down, lay it down, then you just have to take uh, like a butter knife and just get it under the seedling and gently separate it from the adjoining one. Another good way to start seeds that I teach is using newspaper pots. You can roll these pots, you can use a small juice container, uh, something that's cylindrical and about three or four inches tall. Use your newspaper and wind it tightly around it and then pull it off. 
You don't need to tape the bottom if you crimp it and uh, it will hold. Add the so potting soil, add the seed, uh, and then I just have them holding in these six pack trays, but you can put them in any other kind of uh, container just so they'll stand up straight. The difference in planting though is this, when you are growing in a paper pot, you will dig a hole in your, in your ground or in your large pot to accommodate this paper pot and you'll plant the whole plant, paper pot and all. And so if you're not disturbing the roots that way and don't worry, the roots will go through the bottom of the paper pot. Trim away the excess paper because any paper sticking up above the soil level will tend to wick the water away from the roots. So just trim that away so that you have an even layer of soil. Now, I wanted to go on to another unique way of growing that you can all practice now, and that is regrows from the supermarket. Plants that you've bought. So many times you've bought a, a bunch of onions and let it go to waste because you used one or two and then you forgot about the others. I, I think this is not happening as much today. We are really valuing what we've gotten from the market. But let's say that you did have some onions that you didn't get around to cooking. Cut the base of the onion uh, just above that white part, leaving the roots intact, and then plant that stub in the ground or in potting soil. This happens to be a pot. And this is the day I planted it, March 27th. And now, April 7th, you see that I have some new green leaves. So if you wanted to have green onions in your dish over your salad, you know, you can start uh, uh, collecting, start harvesting your green onions. They will get much taller, of course, and you can then keep harvesting. I also have chard growing that pot to show you how you can grow that uh, and a little cilantro in the back. Mitsuba, maybe you don't know this, this is a classic Japanese herb with really delicate, wonderful mixture of flavors. It's hard to define. It, it's like mint and parsley and something else. It is wonderful to put on soups. It'd be terrific on a miso soup. And uh, because it's an herb that's used for its gentle or its delicate flavor, you don't have to grow huge bunches of it because you're not stir frying with this. I bought this a few weeks ago and I neglected to, uh, to I forgot about it in the refrigerator. I pulled it out, it was completely wilted. And so what I did was I trimmed off those wilted leaves, uh, like in the left picture, and I used those that night in a soup. And then I put the rest of it in a pot and so in two days, you see that, March 27th to March 29th, the then tiny leaves really started to grow and expand. And now, this is April 11th, I have two really healthy plants, uh, which I'm still keeping in the pot. This is another great Japanese vegetable that everyone should plant. And this is a summer crop harvested in the fall, so plant it now. Get yourself some satsuma emo, Japanese sweet potato, which is again, far superior to the American sweet potato that we use at Thanksgiving. This is not slimy or stringy inside. Uh, it is it has the texture of like a baked, a good baked russet potato, but it is very sweet and just a lovely flavor. What can you do with it? Well, you can start to get it to sprout by putting it in a, a dish, like a soup dish in water, and it may sprout in two to three to four weeks. If it doesn't sprout in that time, then that tells you that the plant, probably the, the potato probably was sprayed with a growth inhibitor on the outside. And this is another reason I basically don't eat potato skin like russet potatoes because they often are sprayed with antifungicides or growth inhibitors, which the farmers have to do. So this one I got to sprout and I put it in a potting soil in a pot and I'm enjoying it so much as an ornamental houseplant 
that that's what it's doing. And I may eventually get it into the ground. Last year, I did grow those in my garden beds and these are the leaves. The leaves are abundant. The leaves are also edible, but don't harvest all of them because remember what leaves do. They are the factory for the plants to produce the sugars for the plants. So if you eat all of these leaves, then the tuber that you're trying to grow to eat later it is really not going to develop. So try a few. They kind of taste like sweet potato. Surprise. Here's the flower. The flower will form in about, oh, I don't know, August, I guess. And they look just like a, like a morning glory because actually the plant is in the morning glory family. Do not eat morning glories. They are poisonous. But the sweet potato plant is, uh, is edible, both leaf and of course tuber. So the flowering tells you the tubers are being are growing underground and and you'll be able to harvest those when the leaves turn completely brown and that will be in the fall. And then you should take them out of the ground. When you take them out of the ground, knock off the dirt. Um, don't wash it then. Knock off the dirt as much as you can and store it in your garage, which may be warm by then in a dry place and let it cure. And that way the starch in the tuber turns into sugars. And then you can eat that over, I don't know, the next two or three months, I think, just like the kabucha. All right, kohlrabi, I keep trying to sell to everybody to plant in the garden. It is another, it's a dual purpose plant where you can eat the leaves, but again, not too many of the leaves. And this is a fat stem. It's not a root and is absolutely the most delicious uh, mustard plant of all. Really worth growing. I have some seeds that I started about three weeks ago that are gonna go into my garden. So in the fall, you have these wonderful vegetables and fruits. I have a persimmon tree uh, and pomegranate is in the market at that time. I had kale. Uh, so you can make a beautiful and simple salad, just mixing the vegetables with the fruit together. And you know, the greens are in there, right? The kale is in there for that vitamin C and vitamin A. And I think this is my last vegetable to tell you about Sato Imo. Sato Imo is known in other places in the world, the Caribbean and in the South Pacific and Hawaiian Islands as taro. There are two kinds. There's wetland taro, which is mostly the one grown in Hawaii, and that's the one that they make the poi out of, and it's a very large tuber. But we Japanese like to eat the smaller one, the sato imo. And so when you shop for that, um, you know, you're going to cook a lot of those, but see if you can find one that may be starting to bud out because it's wanting to grow. And here, I planted those uh, probably in, let's see, after uh, January, uh, because I buy that for the New Year's dinner, right? And, um, and you plant those, you can plant those in a large pot like this. This is about a 20 inch, I think. And uh, the tubers will start to sprout. These leaves will come up. The um, Hawaiians eat the young tender leaves. And so again, you can eat some of the leaves, don't eat them all because the plant needs that for the photosynthesis. And then in the fall, after the leaves turn brown and dry down, here's your harvest. The Japanese call it imoko, ko means children. And so when you pull up the old plant, you'll find all sort of connected together, strung together, sort of like beads, these uh, sato imo ko, which is very sweet. And this makes a great winter or fall stew, uh, sato imo with carrots and a little chicken or fish, always a green cilantro on top. I want to show you this picture of LA Green Grounds and please note the website, lagreengrounds.org. Our motto is grow food, not grass. And I mean, lawn grass. This was 2016, January 2nd, when a bunch of volunteers answered our call to start a new garden. And this is our teaching garden. It's at Carmona and Bowdoin. And I understand from one of my volunteers that I talked to last night, 
the purple mustard is growing nice and strong. She's going to collect a lot of lettuce and chard and kale. We have a compost bin there because we want to teach that recycling of green waste. Um, we have regular workshops if you go on our website, which unfortunately at this time have been postponed, but um, there you are. All right, and I'll look forward to answering your questions later. Uh, uh, I, oh, oh, <laughs> God. I'm not really cut out for climbing trees. Well, thank you, Florence. That was a ton of information. Say, did you know this grapefruit tree is over 130 years old in Little Tokyo and it's still growing fruit? Talk about longevity. Well, next we're going to hear about another great example of community gardening from Cristel Gonzalez. Cristel is program director for the American Friends Service Committee Roots for Peace program. She supports environmental and food justice for migrant families in Los Angeles. Born and raised in the eastern Coachella Valley, she herself is the daughter and granddaughter of migrant farm workers. How cool is that? Cristal is a master gardener and has been part of the Son Jarocho Fandango community for over 15 years. Wow, science and music, she's got it all. Oh, Cristal! Hi there, thanks Dairo, so good to be here. Good afternoon everyone. It's great to be here uh, for this uh, little Tokyo Earth Day. So I'm gonna share the story of growing a community farm in South Los Angeles. And I really want to highlight how access to land and growing food is a political and a spiritual act, which I think is something that some of our panelists have already begun to talk about. And I think it's powerful when as a society, we, uh, we part with notions of private individual ownership, right? And we decide to collectively steward land and in ways that honor the earth and that honor each other. And that's how I arrived in South Central about 10 years ago. I was invited by Kathy Masaoka and Tony Asumi. They were uh, teaching a continuation high school there at All People's Community Center. And they invited American Friends Service Committee to help their students start a garden. And it was my first week on the job, and uh, my role was to find four to five groups of high school students to help them lead a social justice project in their neighborhood. And uh, Kathy and Tony's students convinced me very quickly that starting a garden uh, was a social justice project, that it was something about equity. And uh, many of those students uh, and Kathy and Tony had visited the South Central Farm years before. And if you know about the South Central Farm, you know that it was 14 acres and one of the largest farms in the United States. If you don't know about the South Central Farm, please uh, watch a film called The Garden. So when I visited the students, uh, one of them said he had grown carrots with his grandfather at the South Central Farm and spent a lot of time with him there. And it was clear to me uh, that the history, both of having something beautiful and of losing it, was something that really politicized uh, food growing for the youth and for a lot of people in this neighborhood of, of South Central and specifically around historic uh, South Central. So for three to four years, uh, Kathy and I worked with students weekly on a small uh, 50 by 10 foot plot uh, growing food. So we composted, we cooked, we hosted some epic uh, harvest parties. It was really a lot of fun. And through all the community building activities we did with students, the seed giveaways, et cetera. Before we knew it, we had supported a small community garden adjacent to the school garden. And uh, we had given a lot of seeds to people in the community. And we were working mostly with folks, uh, Mexican and Central American migrants, who started to come to us regularly for seeds and were passionate about growing food. And they uh, wanted to begin a meeting monthly. They said, uh, and before we knew it, we formed uh, something called the Food Growers Network, which is the people growing food at home and then also growing food in the small community garden adjacent to the school garden. And, um, and we did things like harvest shares. Uh, this is a picture of uh, one of the members, Flor, uh, sharing propagation skills that she has in terms of uh, using things like uh, nopales and uh, rosemary and uh, celery. And uh, so, we gathered and pretty quickly on gathering with the Food Growers Network, they said, we need to convert a vacant lot into a farm. Uh, there's no large community gardens in this area. We lost the South Central Farm. And, um, and as soon as that intention uh, was out there, as soon as uh, La Red de Cultivadores said, 
we, we need to convert a vacant lot, things started to, to line up. And this is a picture a little bit fuzzy, but it is of a, a protest that we had in front of a vacant lot where we began supporting a uh, policy called a UAIZ to access vacant lots. And so uh, we, we were demanding this policy, which did uh, pass at the city level and at the county level got adopted in Los Angeles. And at the same time, just as serendipity would have it, this company, uh, Meta Housing, came uh, and spoke to All People's Community Center, our partners. You can see All People's at the end of the photo. You can see that this vacant lot was right across the street under our eyes. Um, and, and they offered this lot to us. And they said, we are open to a 50-year lease, which we were just so excited about. And, um, and as we uh, began to prepare, it took about 15 months to, to fundraise. It felt like a long time because it was a lot of uh, questions like, will we be able to raise this money to actually uh, you know, remove this concrete, make it the garden we want? And you'll see these are pictures of the fundraising campaign we had. You'll see our members that was Blanca, Reina with their families. And in Spanish here, they, they talk about how uh, it was very clear that they wanted this farm uh, for the earth right, for their children, for their ancestors, and for the community, for our people, right? And we were successful. We, we with help from friends and our partners, All Peoples and, and Meta, we work with the community to lead the, the, uh, the transformation of this lot. And uh, we engaged in all the processes with the community. So I'm gonna show some photos of the development of the farm here. So. This is a community building the raised beds. You'll see that the gravel's already been removed and, and people are doing, we had a carpenter there mentoring folks and there was already skills there, of course, in the community and folks are uh, building their own raised beds. And you'll see in this picture that there's 14 raised beds. So this is where, that's the only thing that was on the lot. And that's how many beds there are now and how many families we support to grow food there. And we are looking at a phase two in a, the back area we grow collectively, but we may be adding um, more beds to support more people to grow food there. Um, and then you'll see that we put in irrigation. These are little baby fava plants. And the fava plants, uh, we use a lot at the farm as a regenerative farming technique. So we use cover crop. And you'll see that there's drip irrigation there that uh, again, our community uh, was able to install themselves, learn how to manage. And this also is a good way to save water. Drip irrigation actually uh, helps you save water versus hand watering. Another great project at the farm, uh, like Amy shared about uh, the compost building community. This is a community project. They're growing food and community. And we are lucky at uh, American Friends Service Committee Roots for Peace program. We have a youth internship program. We have an annual freedom school. And this particular summer, uh, a group of uh, high school youth uh, the Freedom School decided to make a mural of their project. So this is them uh, sketching out the mural. And you'll see uh, what a beautiful mural uh, they developed. And this was 100% youth-led. The lead artist, uh, Jackie Gallardo, she's been in our program as a youth participant for five years. And this was, she's a natural artist, but at 18 years old, or 19, I believe, at this point, she created her first mural. She designed and led this mural that was collectively with the youth. And, and the mural really tells the story of uh, environmental justice, of uh, writing a new story where oil rigs that you can see there in the picture are not polluting our air and waters and that we're caring for the earth and for each other. So this beautiful mural is there in the, the back of the farm. So in this photo, you'll see the corn harvest. This was our first, uh, kind of our first summer at the farm and we had this beautiful corn harvest with native seed and uh, you'll see the um, sembasuchis marigold that were also really abundant and this is mario and there was a lot of pride in sharing around uh, the corn harvest and next you'll see also the other the bounty and i was really uh, so excited because really on any given day you'd see people from their individual beds and that aside from the collective growing areas where there is more food harvest because this is um, Lucy, from just her bed, she had 11 pounds of produce that day, and she's with her daughter who particularly loved uh, the bell peppers there. So um, all of this you can't do alone, right? You build friends along the way, and you build community, and this is a workshop uh, we had with Fandango Obon. We had the uh, West African dance uh, section being shown here, 
And Fandango Obon was with us uh, to celebrate various junctures. Actually, we've had uh, Fandango Obon at block parties there in the community and people have absolutely loved them. And I think Fandango Obon's really brought culture and music and a lot of joy into our work. So you'll see uh, in this next photo, it's similar to a photo Nobuko shared earlier, which was uh, us spending time together in the garden and sharing a seed. So one great thing is we've actually shared, uh, we received shiso seeds and we've had them in the garden and they've actually reseeded for three years. So we've had shiso seeds every time we harvest the shiso seed, um, we smell it, we remember our workshops and our exchanges with our uh, JA community, our friends in Little Tokyo. And you'll, uh, this is a photo of our uh, ribbon cutting event. We had a fandango Obon present there. Again, like I've said, uh, we've been accompanied by Fandango Obon in really beautiful ways. And um, this next photo, you'll see just the big group shot at the end of our uh, community farm ribbon cutting. And it was from 10 to, I believe, 2 p.m. So this was 2 p.m. who was still there just enjoying each other's presence. And you'll see some members of, uh, of the Fandango Obon there and a lot of youth community. So this process of starting a farm has really been intergenerational. It's really been an amazing process to see a vacant lot that was vacant for 30 years to be transformed into a farm. Uh, if you wanna follow uh, American Friends Service Committee Roots for Peace program, and uh, you all share our Instagram, and we also partner with All People's Community Center, and um, I'll share their website as well. And I just wanna end with a quote uh, from a Native American botanist who says that knowing that you love the earth changes you activates you to defend and protect and celebrate. But when you feel that the earth loves you in return, that feeling transforms a relationship from a one-way street into a sacred bond. And I think that that's something that growing food allows you to do is really see, feel, and appreciate that love from the earth. So uh, happy Earth Day, everyone. I hope you, you stay safe and, and well. Happy Earth Day. Thank you, Krista. And now, for something completely different. I told you you'd hear more about that motainai idea. Well, now's the time. Next up is an eco-vid produced by Great Leap and featuring the music of Nobuko Miyamoto and the Great Leap family of artists. Plus a special cameo by yours truly. Please enjoy motainai, the music video. and paper 
and bottles and cans. Garbage you make with your own two hands. Landfills fillin', ocean you're killin', all this trash is making me illin'. I'm really not a rapper. I know, you're a container. Get it? Rapper, container. Remember what Bob Chan used to say. What a waste, what a shame, what you throw away. I should quit my day job and make music videos full time. <laughs> oh wait, I don't have a day job. Well anyways, we're getting close to the end of our program. Sorry we're running a little bit over, but uh, at this time I'd like to introduce someone who's very close to my heart and my head, my arms, my legs, my torso, and my support structure. Uh, yes, in fact you could say he's the man who made me what I am. I'm talking about that chief puppet maker and associate artistic director of Great Leap, director of that music video you just saw, Mr. Motai Nai himself, Dan Kwong. Thanks, Tyro. Well, here we are celebrating Earth Day in the midst of a massive societal upheaval. As many of our systems and institutions are failing us, the unworkability of our profit-based, greed-driven society is clearer than ever. Inequity and injustice are being made even more obvious by this pandemic, and we're seeing a corresponding rise of oppressions being acted out around us. Racism, anti-Semitism, classism, uh, domestic violence, and more. We are being forced to question almost everything about our way of life, from providing health care to food distribution to personal, family, community relationships, to our basic economic system as a whole. Our ancestors earned some hard-won wisdom about how to live in harmony on this planet, wisdom that could use some remembering. We also get to think fresh about new ways, more intelligent, responsible, just, and sustainable ways to live together. We get to reach for the idea that caring for ourselves, caring for one another, and caring about the planet are natural companions to each other. Motai Nai is not just about not wasting things. It's also about not wasting time, energy, life. It's been said that with great upheaval comes great opportunity. Let's see what we can do. To close our virtual Earth Day, we are honored to be joined by master artist Ophelia Esparza and her daughter Rosanna Esparza Ahrens. Ophelia Esparza is a fourth generation Chicana alterista, altar maker. She has passed on this beautiful tradition to her children, including Rosanna, who has become an alterista herself, often creating side by side with her mother. Ophelia's art is guided by a deep spiritual belief in honoring the memory of people, places, and events through the creation of altars. Her extraordinary works have been exhibited nationally and internationally, receiving numerous awards, including the nation's highest honor for traditional artists, a National Heritage Fellowship from the NEA. Now, I'd like to ask Ophelia and Rosanna to lead us in a closing blessing for our event. Thank you so much for honoring us in giving this blessing. We ask, Creator, to bless only 
all of us here in this spiritual event, but people all over the world who are defenders of Mother Earth, who are tending to her beautiful breast and giving. And with that, this time, even if we're isolated or away from our normal life, it gives us time to pause, to listen to the earth. Mother Earth can teach us so much just by the plants. They are so grateful just for the tender, loving care we give them, even a little, and they respond by giving us even more than we expected. In this, in this spirit, giving and tending and taking care of Mother Earth is, comes back to us tenfold and more. All those people working to remind us that we are here for each other and to sustain us in taking care of our Mother Earth are blessed. I offer it with all my heart. Thank you. And I just want to get us all to take a collective breath and a cleansing exhale. And we come with a full heart to say thank you. Thank you, Madre. Thank you, Grandmother Earth. Thank you, Hahanai Rudaichi. Thank you, Mama Dunyani. Thank you, Priki Mata. Thank you, Uchimaka. With our bare feet on the ground, we are grounded. We feel your love. We send you love. Thank you for all the sustainers of this beautiful earth. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for giving. Thank you for loving our community. And in one collective breath, breathe in. We seal this prayer with our promise to continue in this way. Gracias. Well, folks, that's it for our little Tokyo Virtual Earth Day. Thanks for being with us. We hope you got some good ideas as well as some inspiration. If you like this event and want to see more, please let us know. You'll be hearing more from us in the unusual days to come. Stay safe, stay hopeful, stay home. Bye-bye! Thank you to the many sponsors who support Fandango Obon especially the JACCC, which has been the home of our event from the very beginning. If you too would like to support the JACCC and Fandango Obon, please visit the link. Your donation is especially crucial now to help keep our cultural institutions alive. Thank you.